CataractCoach.com. Considerations for monocular patients. These patients have just the one good eye, so you really got to make it perfect for them. So there are a variety of reasons why patients can be monocular in your clinic. Now, it's unusual. I'd say overall in the U.S., it's less than 1% of patients who are monocular, truly monocular. Maybe a little bit more if we're talking about functional monocular. But when these patients come to you for cataract surgery, there's a big challenge. This is the only eye that they're relying on or primarily relying on. And so they have very high expectations. They can also be very nervous. Now, there can be a variety of reasons. I've seen patients who have trauma to the one eye, and that trauma is causing them to become monocular. They had a very bad ruptured globe, let's say. Other patients have a medical condition. It could be relatively monocular. So let's say a patient who had bad macular degeneration in one eye with loss of central macular function. So therefore, the other eye doesn't have any central acuity. So maybe they're 2200 in the other eye. In the patient that we're showing you here, this patient's a high hyperope and had angle closure glaucoma in the other eye. And that angle closure glaucoma was delayed treatment and the patient ended up losing vision. So the optic nerve on the other side is essentially gone and the patient's bare light perception in the other eye. So when it's time for this surgery, we've got to be very careful. Now, talking about eye wall selection, in almost all cases for monocular patients, I really opt for a monofocal lens. And I certainly will do a torque version of a monofocal, like in this case. And we're showing you this video today, by the way, full video, start to finish, one of our complete cataract cases here. So a little gentle hydro dissection here, and there we see that nucleus slightly tilted out of the capsule bag. Let's delineate that too, maybe. There we go. Um, there's a delineation. So you can see a dense central endonucleus. Patients like this who are monocular often will delay surgery for the other eye. And they'll delay it for a long time, for years, because they're just so afraid of having surgery. And because they delayed that surgery, sometimes you could have a more challenging time. Now, this has a reasonable amount of nuclear density, but it's not terrible. So we're going to chop it in half here. There's a good chop. And we can emulsify each half. Now, we're using a smaller incision here, about 2.2 millimeters. You saw we made the incision with the diamond keratome. And we're going to be very cautious here, operating here in the central area of the eye, the safe zone, about the iris plane, staying very centrally here. First half of the nucleus is going to come out of the eye, and we'll do the second half. And this patient ended up um, choosing this monofocal lens, a toric monofocal, as per my recommendations. And we're aiming for a post-op goal of just about Plano. Plano to slightly hyperopic. Now, why would I rather this patient be plus a quarter than minus a half? Well, because the patient has a hyperopia for her life. This patient is used to being a high hyperope. And because of that, we want to make sure the patient's comfortable afterwards. And oftentimes these patients, if they end up Plano or plus a quarter, they're very happy. But sometimes at minus a half, they miss that distance acuity. It's kind of like people like me who are slightly myopic. I like to be a little myopic. I don't want to be corrected to perfect plane. I'd rather be minus a quarter, minus a half. So these hyperopic patients often have hyperopia on the brain, and they like to have that. So we're aiming for just about perfect plane, or maybe a tiny pinch of hyper in the post-op period. And so you can see nucleus removed. Look at the chopper. I just don't want to risk anything. I don't want that posterior capsule to come up inadvertently. So we're very careful, chop it in the safe position so we can block the capsule. And we clean it up very nicely here. Notice the draping too. You don't want to have a risk of, let's say, endophthalmitis here. So look at the draping. Eyelashes sequestered. The lid margin is fully covered by the drape. And so we're very, very cautious in that regard. Cortex removal, I'm watching carefully just to make sure there's no zonulopathy. If the patient had, let's say, a issue of angle closure in this eye, which is not reported, but maybe, maybe she had it, maybe it resolved. Sometimes these eyes that have that angle closure, that can result in zonular laxity as well. So cleaning up the capsular bag here, polishing the undersurface of the anterior capsular rim, that looks pretty good. Cleaning that up pretty nicely. And then here again, we'll put that torque monofocal lens in the eye. Now, when you talk to these patients who are monocular and you know they need cataract surgery, you have to gently encourage them without pushing them towards surgery. You never want the patient to feel like they were pushed into having surgery. But you know as a surgeon, if they elect to do the surgery a little earlier, the risks are actually lower. If they wait till you have, they have an absolutely brunescent, terrible cataract, then the risks of the surgery are higher. So there's a delicate balance there. 
So here comes our monofocal acrylic lens. And it's a toric lens. You can see there the toric eye wall markings. And we'll get that in the capture bag. Notice how I also made the main phaco incision on that steep axis. And that's going to help me ensure that the post-op corneal steep axis is going to stay the same as the pre-op. Because we had astigmatism as magnitude and direction. And we'll just change the magnitude of the astigmatism with our uh, incision. We won't change the direction because the incision is on the steep axis. So we'll clean up the viscoelastic. Notice how I went behind the eye well to remove that viscoelastic. Now we'll get the lens centered up, get it rotated in the correct position. And you can see there's a good overlap of the optic by that rexus. And that looks fantastic. And this patient's going to have a nice outcome. Now, even in the post-op period, for a monocular patient, you probably don't want to patch their eye up because then they won't be able to see out of it. So you can see the eye movement. So there's no retrobulbar injection here. This patient's under only topical and intracameral lidocaine. So sealing the main incision, doing a good amount of hydration here. Notice in the corneal stroma there and the width of the incision. I'm sweeping across here, making sure there's no retained lens pieces, make sure there's no residual viscoelastic left in the angle of the eye, and just kind of fine-tuning fine and adjusting that eye well position. A little bit of viscoelastic will just wash that right out of the eye. And at the end here, I'm definitely going to put in some preservative-free moxifloxacin inside the eye. We want to make sure that we're not going to have a any bacterial load in the eye, I want to decrease the risk of endophthalmitis. So I like that lens position, it's really quite nice, beautifully lined up. And so I'll also put a little bit of triamcinol inside the eye, that's going to help quell some post-op inflammation. Then I'll put a little bit of, a, of dilute carbocol inside the eye to help bring the pupil down, just a tiny bit. And then we'll put in some preservative-free moxifloxacin. And the end here, let's really check the incisions very carefully to make sure that they are 100% watertight. So there's a sponge soaked in tetracaine, and now we can go and touch, and they are absolutely watertight. And I'm happy to tell you the patient had a great outcome. So be very cautious with the monocular patients and give the patient a little bit of extra hand-holding.